Good morning, folks. It's wonderful to have some people that were gone a while back, looking way tanner than any of the rest of us. (laughs) Welcome back. And also, we got some out today for sickness. But we'll continue on in the book of Proverbs. What a wonderful opportunity it is to study God's Word this morning. I hope you don't take any of the studies that take place in church for granted such tremendous value in them and having the time to devote to them is is very very valuable so over the last two weeks if you guys would um, pick up and turn to the book of proverbs we've covered an introduction to the book and we've also spoken last week um, i focused on the attitude that we need to have when we come to a study not just of proverbs but of any book of the bible Last week I talked about some things that every person, regardless of their station in life or their experience, things you need to bring to the table if you're going to receive what God wants you to from the text of Scripture. We talked about a fear of the Lord, a willingness to listen to counsel, which I mentioned is primarily us trusting God to work through others, resisting temptation, and of course shunning or staying away from the presence of evil, and all of those are crucial ingredients for a victorious and also a useful Christian life. And those things and many others must become a normal part of our life. The title for our message today is Hidden in Plain Sight. And I named it this because as I was reading through the text for today, it became very obvious to me that godly wisdom is available for every single man, woman, or child. The issue... And the problem lies not with God, but with men. Because men, from Adam to Ahab, have characteristically despised and blinded themselves to God's wisdom. Though true wisdom is right there, calling out to them, they've turned their hearts and their minds away from the light, preferring their own dark imaginations and thoughts. So our text for today is a wonderful study on the subject of wisdom, and it forms a necessary part of the introduction of this book. We can't just hastily skip over it without an understanding of what godly wisdom is, what it does, and also how men respond to it. It's very difficult to utilize the other instruction in this book properly if we don't get that. So this morning we're going to make an examination of wisdom, her methods, her audience, and her desire. And then we're going to contrast what we learn with what God tells us about the fool. What does a fool value above all else? What is the nature of a fool's heart? And sadly, what can we discover about the fate of a fool? And I'll just say, it's not in my notes, but if you're just joining us in Scripture, the fool, it's not talking about an unintelligent person. It's someone that does not have a relationship with God, or even someone that does, who is behaving according to the old nature, the flesh. That's characteristic of what a fool is. So let's read our text together. It's Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 20. It says, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning. And the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they, for that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Let's pray this morning. 
Father, we thank you for what your word has to say about the subject of wisdom. Lord, and I recognize there are some here today that desperately need to hear this and need to consider what their standing is before you and whether they are truly wise. For those of us that do know you in, in spirit and in truth, I do pray that we would be careful to apply what we hear today, that you'd help me to speak clearly and help us to understand um, exactly what your word says and what it has for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as you can see, we have a lot said here about the subject of wisdom and then also some of the possible responses a person can have to that, right? Because we do have a decision to make when it comes to how we're going to use wisdom. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is the way that Solomon portrays the subject of godly wisdom. Wisdom is an abstract concept, isn't it? But we can see that here it's pictured as a godly and a dignified lady. Now this is called personification, and there's a lot of it in Proverbs, as both wisdom and foolishness are given some human characteristics, it just helps us to understand it better. We're actually going to be introduced to Lady Wisdom's counterpart for the first time later in chapter 5, where foolishness there is personified as a strange woman, and she's called that because of her wicked character and her evil intent. These literary devices are very powerful because they help us take abstract concepts and bring them down to earth, making them very practical and digestible. As a teaching aid, by the way, follow this example. If your students are not understanding a concept, do everything you can to link ideas with real life examples. Don't stay way up in the air when the folks listening desperately need good grounding in the truth. So I really love the way wisdom is portrayed here and it's very high praise to the ladies of this church that God chose to use your gender as an example of what wisdom looks like in real life. The Lord values godly ladies so incredibly highly, and so all of us should do the same. But also, in addition to the blessing of this example, it provides a tremendous challenge, doesn't it, to everyone listening, especially to any lady that studies Proverbs. If God used your life and your character to personify his wisdom, would you line up with the example given in Proverbs? We must all make an application, but what we just read lays a special, eye, special and personalized exhortation at the feet of every saved woman here. Do you want to live up to God's expectations of you? Well, then pattern your life off what you see here. If more people gave Lady Wisdom the time she deserves, they would surely change for the better. Ladies, if you're wondering what a godly woman looks like, you need look no further than what scripture can show you. You don't need a magazine, you don't need the internet, and you certainly don't need the lost that live all around you to be an example. All you need is the right person to emulate, and I can't think of a better example to follow than the wonderful, godly, dignified lady described in these pages. And to the men and young, young men on the same point, a great deal of the value of Proverbs is seen in how we look at the contrasts that are presented here. You, as husbands, are intended by God to establish and maintain the kind of environment in your homes that results in your wives developing wise and godly character. Though not every part of their spiritual growth is up to you, still you will have a massive influence, the biggest influence on their development for good or for evil. Let none of us as men be forced to say that we were more of a distraction than a help to our wives and our sisters in this area. And young men, as you think about a future wife, you can't find a better example of what you should be looking for than what we see right here. Though no earthly lady will perfectly exemplify true wisdom, still the qualities of chastity, discretion, and godliness given in this book should be a guide for who you will pursue in marriage. There is a reason why wisdom is portrayed as a godly woman and foolishness is pictured as a strange woman or a seductive temptress. Your fallen flesh, young men, will always desire what the strange woman has to offer, leading you to ignore the subtle evidence of true godliness. Holiness is never provocative or boisterous, it does not attract the flesh. Men, and especially young men, must be on guard against certain things that would seek to attract them to a girl for all the wrong reasons. So we can see that both men and women should be using lady wisdom right out of the gate as a very practical and helpful example. 
There is an important reason why God chose to portray her this way. Now, I have a few points that we need to cover to learn more about wisdom, as well as the typical response of a sinner to her words. So first, let's talk about Lady Wisdom's methods. Number one, wisdom's methods. You can see right from verse 20 that godly wisdom operates using a specific method and a strategy. The text says, wisdom crieth without. She speaks in the streets, in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city, she cries. What do all these locations have in common? You'll notice it doesn't say, wisdom crieth inside, in the closets, in the private place, in the quiet of the forest, in the countryside. Godly wisdom is characteristically seeking out the people who need her the most. As a result, she can be found in the markets, the gates, the places where people gather. Lord willing, she can be found here when we assemble together. But her method and God's objective in sharing her is to touch and to affect as many people as possible. God is not in the business of hiding wisdom, preventing men from having access, or stifling spiritual growth. We have to approach God correctly, certainly, but God's desire is obvious that his people would be as wise and mature as possible. More than that, that every man, woman, and child born into this world would have ears to hear, would listen to his wisdom, and would enter into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as a result. Access to God's wisdom comes through the door of salvation. Remember, though, we're talking about lady wisdom, Even though we're talking about that, every shred of wisdom we could bring up finds its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 tells us, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. John 14.6 adds to the necessity of salvation by stating, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You see, the ultimate purpose of wisdom's cry is that it would be heard by those that are living in bondage to foolishness. And far more than merely making their earthly lives better, God desires that people would be rescued from that foolishness. So wisdom's method is to provide an opened and unashamed proclamation of the truth. She specifically seeks out and prioritizes the places where people are available. You can also see all the descriptions of how she speaks. Lady Wisdom cries. She utters her voice. She declares. She doesn't whisper, mumble, or speak in cryptic language. Simply, Wisdom preaches. She voices the truth abroad to all that will listen. Now we could spend a great deal of time applying the example here to the work of evangelism. I hope without even analyzing, you're able to see that our methods should be the same. Find the people, go to them, don't wait for them to bump into you or cross your path. Go to where the people are and preach. Lift up your voice, cry aloud. This is how God conveys his wisdom. So Lady Wisdom has a method. Next, let's talk about her audience. Number two, Wisdom's audience. This point comes out of verse 20 and 21. You can see exactly who she's targeting with her reproof. Verse 21 says... How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. Number one, simple ones. Number two, scorners. Number three, fools. Wisdom's audience is primarily the fools of this world. That's who she's ministering to and seeking out. Now, when we speak further on the biblical fool, you're going to find out there are actually five different types of fools described in Proverbs. There are five different Hebrew words that identify a different kind of fool. In the verse we just read, the terms simple, scorner, and fool are all translated from three different Hebrew words. But for our purposes this morning, what you need to know about wisdom is that it's specifically targeted at fools. As it stands in the gates and open places, She's seeking out those that don't have the benefit of godly wisdom. This shows us that though we often think about God's wisdom or think about how it can benefit me, 
The way we should be thinking is to ask how godly, godly wisdom can benefit others. Whatever you gain in the area of wisdom is intended to be turned around and invested for the growth and benefit of other people. As I've said many times, it's not true wisdom unless it can positively affect other people. You can see that Lady Wisdom's example is not about amassing a bunch of wisdom and knowledge to herself and then looking down on others. However, that's unfortunately a pretty natural human tendency. We easily forget that everything God provides is meant to be shared. Also, make sure you're not thinking of this just in terms of the lost versus the saved. As I said two weeks ago, it is entirely possible for a genuine Christian to so compromise his walk with Christ that he takes on most of the characteristics of a fool for a time. It's unacceptable, it's a tragedy, but it can happen. In this case, then, wisdom will always seek out, target, and try to restore such a person. I think of Galatians 6, 1 through 2, which says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. In this text, those that are spiritual are merely those that are walking according to the spirit rather than the flesh. Another way to say it would be if you see a brother struggling with the effects of an unsubmitted life, the proof of your submission to God is that you will step in and seek to rescue your brother through the application of God's word. If you're walking according to the Spirit and are able to see the situation clearly, then benefit your weaker brothers and sisters by reaching out to them. That's the whole point of having a body of believers surrounding you, by the way. There are times when all of us are unspiritual in the same sense as this verse. Having lost sight of God's wisdom, we need those that love us to step in and remind us how we should be thinking. So wisdom, lady wisdom, is like a heat-seeking or really a heart-seeking missile headed straight towards the people that need her help the most. They are her audience. The fool is her target. Now next we find that lady wisdom has a deep desire not just for the fools of this world, but also for each one of us. Nothing about ministry or God's work in this world is robotic, impersonal, or devoid of feeling. Because of his love and his deep longing for our redemption, the Father sent the Son. He made the first move. He always does. And his desire for people shows through clearly in verse 23. What is wisdom preaching in the city? And how would she plead? with the stubborn fool. Number three, wisdom's desire. She cries, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. For those that might protest, why are you always talking about repentance? Show me repentance in the Old Testament. Folks, here it is. Wisdom's call is to turn, to repent. That's what repentance means, to turn to turn from our old wicked ways, the direction we were going, and in response to God's truth, enabled by his salvation, we walk in a brand new direction. In salvation, the Lord pours out his spirit unto us, giving us the power to do things we could never do on our own. If I could summarize the purpose of wisdom in one verse, this one would be it. We find all of salvation and sanctification contained in this one verse. God's desire for you through the preaching and proclamation of his wisdom, first and foremost is that you would recognize your wickedness and your foolishness, that you would turn from that evil, trust in Christ for deliverance, and then live in the power of his spirit and the light of his word. You can see the sincerity of Lady Wisdom's attitude here, her regret over the negative response given by so many people. She wants nothing more than to watch someone respond to her reproof that the Spirit might be poured out to them and that God might make his word known to their heart. We must not get lost in the weeds, either in a study like this or in our work of ministry. This is what it's all about, folks. If you are saved today, then the reason that God has blessed you with his Spirit and with his word is that you would be able to plead with others about their need for his wisdom. He desires that you would exemplify the same attitude and the same desire spoken about here. 
that your love and your concern for the hearts of others would drive you to reach out to them. And that if there is rejection, your heart would break over them the same way that your Savior does. We must shine forth this attitude. We must use the same methods as wisdom. We must have the same target audience. And now we must develop and maintain the same desire. There is so much foolishness in this world, you can't hardly turn around without contacting somebody that needs what you have to offer. Be sure that wisdom's cry is also your own. We are calling fools to return to God, and through that call, he will accomplish everything else in their life. So we can see that wisdom is personified for a reason, that she provides a wonderful example, that there's great guidance here for us, and that the loving heart of wisdom is the, also the loving heart of God. Let us desire the same things that he does. Now we're going to move away from that description for a moment, and we're going to discuss the opposite side of the coin that's also made very clear in verses 20 through 33. As I mentioned, the problem of people's reception of truth, it's not on the side of God. He has not hidden wisdom. I hope you see that clearly. Rather, he declares it openly. The issue is that men purposely blind themselves to that truth. Though wisdom is highly visible, to them it might as well be hidden in plain sight. In verses 22 and 23, or 24 through 32, we find the fool's love, fool's heart, and fate described in great detail. Now, this is helpful to us, not just of what it warns us to avoid but because it helps us to know exactly what we're dealing with when we minister to the lost. Now, I spoke of five types of fools, and all of us, we enter this world as a fool. Where we go from there is up to us. The first thing we can see from verse 22 is what the fool loves. Number four, the fool's love. Wisdom cries, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? The word simplicity is from the Hebrew pethi, and it means to be naive or ignorant about life. By the way, that's the first kind of fool. We all start off as ignorant, don't we? There's nothing wrong with that as long as we don't insist on staying there. A significant barrier to the reception of wisdom is the fact that fools characteristically love their foolishness. Have you ever heard the phrase, ignorance is bliss? That idea was never truer than in spiritual things, in people's thinking. Though this area, ignorance, is deadly dangerous, people still love to hang on to everything they don't know about God and they don't know about his ways. Verse 22 also says, The scorner delights in his scorning and that fools hate knowledge. We infer that the fool loves his ignorance. So the real issue as you proclaim the truth is that you're calling people to give up and abandon something that they really, truly, sincerely love. God's wisdom converts a love of foolishness into hatred and a hatred of knowledge into love. When you're saved, you suddenly hate what you once loved and you love what you once hated. When you grow in Christ, you grow to hate more things and love more things at the same time. God makes you more sensitive to evil and to righteousness over time, and your conscience is shaped, trained, and molded by that process. The first problem with the fool, even the Christian operating in a foolish manner, is that he or she loves their simplicity. It's not that God moves people from a point of neutrality. No, the light of truth shines into deep darkness. That's where God's wisdom finds us, totally blinded, totally lost, and completely helpless. So the first contrast here, Lady Wisdom is trying to deliver people from something that they love. Next, what is the nature of the fool's heart? Whether dead in trespasses and sins or walking according to the flesh. Verse 24, 25, 29, and 30 uses words like refused, regarded, not, none, hated, chose, and described or despised. And in these descriptions, we find number five, the fool's heart. If there was any doubt as to the willful nature of the fool or the real challenge of ministering truth to them, that should be cleared away when you read this text. We find that though wisdom is as open as it is obvious, men take one look at what she has to offer, and rather than receiving it, they despise it, 
turn up their noses at it and disregard it. It's kind of like when God flooded the earth with water. Did you know that Noah was preaching righteousness for 120 years? That he built an ark? That he opened the door to all the animals and despite all of that information, pretty much everybody listening to him refused to get on board? If you are wondering why there always seems to be a seemingly small response to the truth in our day, take comfort that wisdom has always been in the minority. The heart of the fool characteristically ignores God's offer of forgiveness and his instruction in righteousness. This is why the Bible often repeats many of the same principles and commands, pounding the truth into our thick and unspiritual heads. Don't be surprised at the evidence of a fool's heart. Don't be shocked when most will not respond to the light of the gospel, the truth of God's word. It's not your responsibility to try to improve upon God's wisdom or make it appealing to the lost. Wisdom, instruction, reproof, the gospel, these things are already wonderful things. They can't be enhanced or improved upon. The problem is not that Christians are failing to attract unsaved people. The problem is that fools have a heart that is evil and that's turned away from God. And so that's why Lady Wisdom shouts from the rooftops, and yet the vast majority of those that hear her do not respond in a positive manner. That doesn't mean that she changes her methods, her audience, or her desires. We continue to preach the gospel, recognizing that if someone responds, it will not be of our doing. We must challenge the will of fallen men and call them to repent of their own way and their failure to fear the Lord. More personally, we must all recognize that spirit that still lives within us, the flesh that still wants to do all the things mentioned by these verses. There is a part of you that will always want to go astray from God, that will always want to ignore what he wants from you, and that's the old heart of the fool cropping back up, the heart that loves simplicity. Now we're moving quickly through this part to get to all of it, but the last thing I want to draw out for you on the issue of foolishness comes back to the results of ignoring wisdom which is number six, the fool's fate. Now, Lady Wisdom pulls no punches as she describes what's going to happen to those that disregard God's reproof. She says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Also verses 31 and 32. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Certainly not a positive outcome. For all of their scorning and simplicity, the inevitable result for the fool is destruction. Here we have Lady Wisdom using some hyperbole to drive home the impact of ignoring her. In similar fashion as many other Old Testament verses, she is said to laugh and to mock. Basically, what the fool has done will return back on his own head. He's judged by his own behavior. You can see the judgment of fools involves fear, desolation, destruction, distress, and anguish. Though they may be self-confident and depending on their own wisdom, God says their destruction will come very quickly. As a whirlwind, the text says. A person's response to Lady Wisdom comes with an expiration date. Heeding what she says is a matter of urgency. One of the main problems with the fool is that he waits until it's too late to consider what God says. Verse 28 indicates that for many there will come a time when they will want to take advantage of wisdom and truth. Even diligently desiring to know or to understand what they've been lacking. And the problem is, the fool, he passes by God's chosen time for his salvation and his rescue. Because he wants to approach God in his own way and his own timing, he fails to respond until it's too late. Verse 28 is very interesting because if you remember at the beginning of this, Lady Wisdom goes from being completely accessible and out in the open to everyone to being entirely out of reach. For any here that may not yet be saved... If you continue to delay submission to Christ, there will come a day when you can no longer respond. When the conviction and the promptings of the Holy Spirit have been despised, when the pleading of wisdom has been silenced, if you hear God's voice through his word, don't harden your heart. Respond 
Yield to it today. Don't continue on in your human foolishness and rebellion, lest the day that's spoken of here come into your life. Verse 32 mentions the opposite of godly sorrow and repentance. People turning away, people being distracted by earthly prosperity. The fool's fate is sure destruction. So we're not only to see a wonderful picture of wisdom in this text, we also have the opposite side on full display. And which one that you will follow and emulate is entirely up to you. Now as we conclude, I want to bring out just a couple more things to your attention. Because verse 33 is so encouraging. Despite all of the problems spoken of in most of this passage, there will be those that respond to the light that they're given. Verse 33 says, But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. The desire of wisdom is that you would hearken, that you would listen to her reproof, and that this reproof would serve to turn you in a different direction. In verse 33, we have the wise listener or the wise son mentioned. In contrast to the simple fool or the, or the scorner, some people do allow themselves to be affected by the truth. Some of those that walk past Lady Wisdom in the marketplace do asi turn aside to listen to her. Some that are in the gate are challenged to consider her words. Some are pulled away from their business long enough to think, really think about what she has to say. I think of all of us, or I think all of us have experienced the blessing that it is to interact with someone that is willing to respond to reproof. Dealing with all the foolishness and hardness of heart mentioned in this text can frankly be very exhausting. But that one person that listens and regards the word of God can be such a blessing. The main challenge to us in this study as believers is to always be that kind of person. You know, sometimes hardness of heart and foolishness, it sneaks up on us very gradually. We might move very far from a spiritual attitude and almost not even recognize the drift. Though no Christian can drift away completely, they can certainly enter into a state where it's much harder for God to grab their heart, like he used to be able to. Listen, listen, listen. Let the truth affect you. Don't grow numb or calloused against it. Verse 33 is God's promise, just like verse 23. If you remain sensitive to Lady Wisdom, if you listen to her words, you can be delivered from all of the trouble that's endured by the fool. That's not to say you'll never have trouble in this world, but it won't be trouble of your own sinful making. God's promise is that if we're faithful to respond to a book like Proverbs in the right way, we will dwell or live in safety, and God will preserve us from fear of evil. One chief aspect of the fool's destruction comes through fear, but here the Lord protects us from fear. So how can we draw all of this together? What do we glean and what do we apply from such a detailed description of wisdom and foolishness? As with all other examples, God intends that you would pattern your life and your heart after the example seen here of wisdom. Folks, he wants you to, wants you to use the same methods. He wants you to have the same audience and also the same desires. He wants you to know what a fool loves, what the nature of his heart is, and also what his fate is. Not just for ministry, but for tough personal application. All of us have quite a fool living inside. And to what degree that fool takes control depends on our walk with the Lord. And finally, the Lord is faithful to give us encouragement and to show us the unspeakable blessing of living a wise life. So saved or lost, it's all up to you because Lady Wisdom pleads, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Whether that needs to be true of you for the first time in salvation, or that's something you need to think about even now as a saved person, I leave that to you to make the right application. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word, for the very clear picture of wisdom seen here, and also the very um, insightful picture of the fool as well. And we pray that we'd carefully guard our hearts against all the things that are spoken of, of loving simplicity and scorning and these types of things. Uh, Lord, that we consider the, 
the method that you have in proclaiming the truth to people, the audience that we're supposed to be going towards, and also our heart's desire that it would match your own um, in seeking to bring people to you. Thank you for your great love and mercy shown to each person in this room. In Jesus' name, amen.